All right. Hello, everyone, and welcome back to Inside Writing. This show is presented by Gotham Writers, offering writing classes of all types and sizes. You can visit us online at GothamWriters.com. Before we get started, a couple of announcements. Firstly, the Gotham Writers Conference is open for registration, and it's only it's less than two weeks away. So if you want to sign up and get a peek behind the publishing curtain, you can do that also on the Gotham Writers website. Secondly, if this is your first time joining us, welcome. And you can get caught up on all of our previous seasons and episodes on the Gotham Writers YouTube channel or on any major podcasting platform. And while you're there, please uh, like us, subscribe, leave a review. It helps to spread the word. Regarding today, at any point in the show, you can use the Q&A function to ask questions of our panelists. Most of you are familiar with Zoom at this point, but if this is your first time on Zoom, on the dashboard there, you'll see uh, Q&A. And if you click that, you can submit your questions for the Q&A portion at the end of the show. Uh, there's also a chat function, which we're already making good use of. That's awesome. So you can keep your general chat down there, but any questions for the panelists, please put that in the Q&A. All right, on to the conversation. So today we're talking with Tommy Dean. Tommy is the editor at Fractured Lit and Uncharted. He's the author of the flash fiction chapbook special, like The People on TV from Redbird Chapbooks. His work has appeared in numerous literary publications, including Bull Magazine, The MacGuffin, The Lascaux Review, New World Writing, Pit Head Chapel, and New Flash Fiction Review. His story, You've Stopped, was chosen to be included in Best Microfiction of 2019. And his new flash fiction collection, called Hollows, is coming out from Alternating Currents Press in February of 2022. So hello, Tommy. Welcome back to the show. Thank you. <laughs> Little technical difficulties already. <laughs> I, I like the delay. It was it was built suspense. Yeah. Uh, so Tommy, you make a living as a literary magazine editor, which well, plural editor of, of literary magazines. Uh, I want to get to that in a second, but I do want to start at the beginning. Which like when did what was that first creative spark for you that set off this path? Yeah, I think it's a great question. Um, like a lot, unlike a lot of people, I didn't start necessarily from a really young age. I didn't really write much. Uh, in fact, my daughter's nine and she writes way more than I wrote when I uh, was growing up. Um, but I always had a book in my hand and I just, um, I wasn't sure I could do what they were doing, the magic that they were creating in my head. So it took a while. I wanted to be a lawyer. Um, I wanted to be a prosecutor like the people on Law and Order, which I think is a lot of people's <laughs> dreams maybe. Um, but then I got to college and I was like, oh, I don't have the personality for this. Um, I don't see things in black and white. I see things in very gray um, and hopefully things in very empathetic kind of situations. Um, so I took that first short story writing class um, and they gave us sudden fiction that that ver that uh, book from 1986 uh, that first kind of started with collecting flash um, and you know I, I read that and uh, I read a story by Elizabeth Talent uh, called no one's a mystery and I just fell in love and I was like I really really want to try um, to do this so then I went with you know a double major of criminology and creative writing um, then had a bunch of people ask me if I was going to write crime novels. And um, it, I just fell in love with literary writing and, and flash. And so um, it, I decided to write. Um, I decided to try to um, apply to MFA programs. I got rejected from all of them <laughs> that I applied to out of, out of undergrad, which actually was, I think, a good thing for me. Uh, my writing was not ready. I had not been writing since a kid. So... Um, even if that 10,000 hours has been debunked, I still had not put in enough time of writing um, in order to, to, to get good enough to be in those, those MFA programs. Um, and so I went and worked kind of like a social worker and was writing on the side um, as I was doing social service uh, kind of work um, until I felt like I was hopefully good enough to try the MFAs again. And then I, I got approved uh, or accepted by two um queens uh queens university of charlotte and um spalding and decided to go with charlotte because i was already in north carolina so I, I find that interesting that flash fiction was sort of the first thing that got you into this in the first place and that's where you are still today yeah having established yourself as a, as a premier flash writer i, I do want to get back to your writing here in a second but what you know tracking the path of you becoming the editor of all these literary, well, two literary magazines from this consortium of literary magazines. What was there like a stepping stone there that got you into this? Like, what was your first editorial step? 
Yeah. So I think it's a great, um, so I read, you know, I read everything. Like I found lit journals, right? I started writing and I said, where on earth I want to try to get published. Where do these things go? Um, and this was when Duotrope was still free. Um, this is when you would still pick up the, the, uh, writer's market magazines and go through all of those. Like I'm, I'm, I'm right. You know, when you were submitting still on the internet, like I wasn't using very many of the mail in. So I'm not quite at that point. Um, cause I started writing in 2004, 2005, started trying to get my stuff published in 2006, even though they were early and immature mm -hmm. attempts. Um, and so I just read everything that I could get my hands on as far as the internet went. Smoke Long Quarterly, of course, was a beacon for me, um, but just anywhere. And then eventually I was like, well, how do you work at a place like this? Like I knew I was missing community. I was by myself. Uh, I was in you know, Indiana and then I moved to North Carolina and there wasn't a lot of writers groups. Um, and the ones that I found weren't writing what I was writing. And so I was like, I, I needed to find some kind of community. This was before before Twitter, really, at that point. Um, so I think I just was looking at calls for people to work at magazines. And the first one I worked at was called Girls with Insurance, uh, which has a fantastic name, but it didn't really last very long um, in the sense that, like, the editors had to go and solicit a lot of the work um, that we were trying to publish. Um, and so that made it difficult because here I am trying to build community and I don't know who to ask <laughs> to come publish with us and we don't have a name. So like, would people, you know, want to publish with us? And so it was a struggle. Um, so eventually that kind of died out. And then I worked, uh, and then I published a story with uh, Split Lip uh, Magazine, um, had a great experience uh, with them and the editing behind that. And I was like, oh, I kind of want to see if I can go work for them. So I went and read for them for almost two years. Um, just doing a lot of first reads um, and gaining that kind of experience. Um, and then I stopped because uh, I wanted to concentrate on my own writing because um, it is hard to do all that reading and your own writing. And I was uh, teaching at a, a middle school um, doing special education. Um, my daughter had been born at that point. Um, so it, it was, yeah, trying to get all that stuff into a day is very difficult as, as most people know. Um, so I stopped to do my own writing. And then again, I went and got something published with Craft um, and decided that I, I loved working with the editor there at the, at the time and went to work for them as well. Um, did a lot of first reads um, until I became a section editor for Flash Fiction. And then I was seeing all the second and third and fourth reads and having the opportunity to help select the stories that we were gonna be publishing. Um, and then they decided that I was doing a good enough job that they wanted to start another Flash magazine. And that's where Fractured came from. Mm. That's awesome. And you, you brought up so many points there that I want to get back to uh, uh, when we move on towards talking your goals and your vision as an editor. But I want to talk about this because it's a consortium of magazines, which it's craft, it's master's review, it's Fractured, it's Uncharted. This may be a silly question, but how does that operate? Because in the world of literary magazines, you rarely see it where, at least correct me if I'm wrong, I don't, I don't see a lot of like all these magazines are one family. So how does this thing operate and what is it? Like, how, do, how does it work? Yeah, it's a great question. Uh, well, a lot of it started before I came on board. I, Fractured has only been around for, you know, a year and a half. Um, and Uncharted's only been around for, you know, four months, six months at this point. Um, but it started with the master's review. Um, it's, it started with their original owners. Uh, I think the original owner was an angel investor and his wife wanted to run a literary magazine and she was really well versed in that world. Um, they got Lauren Groff to judge their very first anthology collection. Um, so they started, you know, really strong with master's review. It's been around for 10 years. Um, which that alone, or maybe almost 12 years, that alone um, is a hard thing to do in the literary journal scene um, without uh, financial backing from a college. Um, there are magazines that have done it without that financial backing, but it can be difficult. Um, so I think the idea was that, that Master's Review um, was becoming well-known, was doing well, um, getting a lot of submissions, um, paying money out to a lot of writers that they decided to to add more magazines um, in order to go into some other fields. There's two poetry journals. Uh, we have Voyage, which is a YA journal. 
Um, and then we have craft, um, which is really focused on craft of short stories, nonfiction now and flash. And then with fractured, I think they also saw that, uh, we could put out a really good magazine that people would want to read, um, that writers would want to submit to, um, and found ways, um, to make sure that we could pay our writers without using submission freeze. We're always open, always free, regular submissions, but we do run contests. Um, and that is kind of the circle uh, that kind of gives back to the writers that we that we pay when we publish them, um, if they are not submitting um, through a fee. Um, we also have, our contest have three times the industry average as far as the winner. Usually the winner gets $3,000. A lot of places only give out 500 or $1,000 and we give out 3,000 to the winners. Um, our goal is just to give writer is a great place to be published um and we felt like we could do that together as a group uh, we could face problems as as editors and kind of sustain um what we're doing again as as kind of, like you said a kind of a consortium just um it's hard um with individual magazines and individual ed editors um trying to do everything you know kind of by themselves um and we're hoping to be journals or magazines that that, that last um mm -hmm forever like i hope that you know I, i'm doing this you know 10 12 15 years from now so I, I that's awesome so you started out as a reader for craft and then they just noticed that you were doing a great job and, and pulled you from there yeah and I, I think publishing helps as well like you know if you're not only reading and doing a good job of you know sending up messages to the editors about what you like or didn't like about some of the stories in the queue and having a sensitivity um for for the not only the craft of the writing um but just for good storytelling but then also i i can't discount the fact that i was publishing and publishing a lot um and publishing i hope and in, in, in journals that i'm absolutely proud to be in um, and I think that not only did that make me a better writer and a better, but it also made me a better editor along the way. Mm -hmm. And, you know, there, there are so many literary magazines out there and they come and go. <laughs> and, and you, like you said, these ones have sticking power. Is, is there like a formula to a successful literary magazine? What makes these ones stick around where others might fail? I think that's a great question. Um, I, I don't want to blame any magazine that starts and fails because I think a lot of times um, people are excited and they want to work with writers and they want to form that community and making a lit journal is one of those ways to do that. I think I had toyed around with, you know, doing my own literary journal before this position had come up as well, just because I was like, I love reading flash. I love seeing what people are doing. I love helping writers be successful and maybe a literary journal is one way to do that. So there are ways I think that, when people do it on their own, that like stuff in life comes up and it, it just becomes untenable to keep going. And I completely understand that. And, and, and they're not cheap if you want to support your writers financially. Um, not that all magazines need to do that by any means either. I've definitely published in plenty of places that I haven't been paid for, but I was still super excited to reach an audience, right? Like that's what the journals hopefully can do is provide an audience for you. And so I think one of the ways that hopefully we're successful is getting writers and readers to trust us that when you turn to tune in, right? Like that 1950s kind of thing, <laughs> when you log on on Mondays and Thursdays to fractured, hopefully you're excited to see what we have coming for you. Um, that it's going to be great storytelling. It's going to be in a great example of flash, maybe a different way of looking at flash than you've, than you've seen before. Um, we're going to have authors or writers that, that you know, that you've seen before, but we're also going to have writers that are from high school, uh, writers that are from the UK or any other country um, that's across the seas uh, or Mexico or Canada. Um, we want to kind of just give you the best view of what is happening in Flash right now. Um, and so I think that's one way to be successful is is to do that to give your your readers who are who are naturally are writers hopefully that are submitting as well um not only a safe place but a great place um to to publish um and i think knowing that hopefully you have a backing that you will stay around long enough will give more writers and readers a reason to to check into the magazine um mm -hmm. i know when i'm looking for places to submit um 
I'm hoping it's a place that that's gonna that's gonna last, or a place that I've seen other people publish that that I respect and read on a on a daily or weekly or monthly basis as well. But also, hopefully, something exciting and something new as well. Mm -hmm. So you kind of answered this a little already, but I want to ask it more specifically here because you mentioned how you want to be doing this in 10, 15 years. What is, it's a lot of work running literary magazines. What what is it that's so fulfilling about it? Um, I love helping writers. Um, I also teach as well. Um, some of this is just like a burning desire that I had when I first started writing, wanting to reach out to the writers that I loved, right? Um, the writers that were doing things that I was excited about or the books that I loved reading or The Flash. Um, and then I feel like in our community, it's small enough that like you can reach out to a lot of these writers and appreciate uh, or show your appreciation. Um, and so my goal is just to, yeah, help get more Flash to more readers, um, to help writers um, find great places to publish their work, um, to showcase their exciting writing um i i just i love flash i love helping writers i love thinking about flash um i have a sub stack where you know i kind of break down certain flashes and uh just look at it from the way i see craft and the way that i see craft working um it, it's a true joy for sure uh, i also get to work you know from home and work with writers um i enjoyed <laughs> being a special education teacher um but I love this more um, just because we're all kind of hopefully pursuing the same thing, right? We want to put good stories out into the world and we want people to notice <laughs> notice our good stories. And so I feel like that that's my job is to get my writers, our contributors noticed. Um, so yeah, that's why I want to keep doing it, I guess. Because you're right. Um, when I first started, I did not realize how much administrative work there is to being an editor-in-chief of getting contracts ready, getting stuff ready to be published, um, answering emails, which is all good. Like I love talking to, to writers and all that kind of stuff. But I also love being in the queue because my my main love is to, is to read. Um, and I don't get to be in the queue quite as much <laughs> as I would like to be just because there is a big administrative um, side of work over here, which again, I'm blessed and privileged to be doing. Um, and it's not, bra you know, it's not backbreaking work by any means, but um, it can be, you know, a little bit of a slog sometimes. So hopefully when I get tired of, you know, doing the administrative work, I get back in the queue um, and get reading again. Mm -hmm. So that, that leads me to ask you about Uncharted because you were doing all this work with Fractured and then, you know, you, you mentioned how much you love Flash and then you stepped out of that and Uncharted became a thing, which is not Flash and it's genre fiction. So what what was sort of the impetus to get that going? Yeah, well, I think we looked around and we were like, we're in all these literary spaces and there's a whole nother world of writing that we're just not, uh, we haven't stepped our toes in. We haven't figured out a way to, to, to give those writers a, a good premium kind of space to publish their work as well. Um, I really love, you know, crime and mystery. That's probably the genre that I'm tied to the most. And so it's been great to kind of get back into, to reading those, uh, kind of works, um, and reading those longer stories. Um, but I am truly kind of like a managing editor for Uncharted. We really rely on our associate editors to be finding like this best thrilling stuff that fit within the genres that twist the genres, um, yourself being one, obviously, Josh. Um, and we, and so I'm learning every day how to be a better reader of, of genre. But I think that they thought, hey, you're doing a great job running this literary journal. You can run another literary journal if we get you the right help to find the best stories that we can through our queue. And I really do think we're finding some really exciting stuff, um, stuff that is different. Um, than Flash. Um, and But I'm learning to love that that work as well. I'm really excited about um, getting a chance to nominate some of these stories that we published so far and just seeing what's going to happen um, with science fiction and fantasy and horror and thriller and crime and mystery. Um, mm -hmm. It's really kind of exciting uh, that there's all these other writers that I didn't know about that my, my world has opened up to even more. Um, so that's pretty exciting too. Yeah. Um I want to talk a bit about your editorial vision and, and what you put into a magazine. So obviously, you know, when you started Fractured uh, and all these literary magazines, I mean, all the literary magazines out there, they have their own voice and their own vision, their own sort of brand or aesthetic. How did you, how do you go about establishing that? Like how much, how much of Fractured was you 
bringing your vision to it and how much of it was, this is what we want from you. Now go make it happen. Yeah. Uh, I think that's a great question. Um, we have an editorial director, uh, Josh Wark. Um, he also runs frontier poetry as the, the, the editor in chief there, uh, and has given us a lot of leeway in, in kind of designing the magazines to our own taste or our own taste along with our associate editors and our volunteer readers. Uh, it's definitely a team effort for sure. It's not just like, me from top saying like this is the exact story that we're looking for and then the readers go out and look for that that's not really what happens we have so many talented flash writers that are readers in their own right uh, who are publishing in all kinds of amazing places and who are you know um great readers as well and so it's kind of a meshing of all that you know i had an idea kind of when i started that we wanted stories that that long that linger after the flash we wanted stories that hopefully you wouldn't just read once and go, oh, okay, that was fine. And just put it to the side. We're hoping for things that like you keep thinking about, you know, two or three days later or stories that you want to recommend when other people are asking like, Hey, what are you reading? What kind of flash are you reading? Um, I obviously have my own kind of aesthetics, but they've, they've changed quite a bit. I think when I first started, I was like, this is what a flash is. And now I'm like, Ooh, this is what a flash is. And this is what a flash is. And this is what a flash is. And like, oh, I never would have thought of that, but this is working so well. Um, and so that's kind of what I'm hoping to champion now is just so many different ways of looking. At, and I call Flash a form. I think it's its own unique kind of form. Um, and looking at the form and the ways that we can manipulate it um, to tell a good story. Like, that's what we're here for. So I'm really interested in characters and character development. Um, but sometimes, you know, we get stories that, you know, a tornado is the antagonist that I never would have like, <laughs> I never would have thought of, but like, it, it's so quirky and it works so well. Um, or a, a ghoul is the antagonist. Like we've just had some really cool stuff that, you know, sometimes fits the trad traditional lens, um, which is probably where I'm more at. But then, you know, like between KB Carl and Amy Barnes, like they're a lot more into quirky and weird. Um, and so, you know, we have these conversations and that's just kind of what comes out of that, I guess. Uh, it's the same with Uncharted, right? Like, I think I might have had an idea of like what sci-fi was or what crime was. Um, but I, again, learn every day from the conversations that we have with associate editors about like, hey, this is why I'm loving this. Um, and these are the stories that like, oh, we're just, we're hooked on. Um, so I think it's hard. We'll, we won't come out and be like, hey, send us your best stuff, right? Because like, what does that mean? Your best stuff for each magazine, I think, is 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 totally different. Um, which is why, as a writer, like I'll submit 50, 60 times to a journal before I get in sometimes. Um, just because like the writing changes, I change, or this one idea of the story is a one-off. Like I'll never write that kind of story again, but it works well for this. So yeah, we won't necessarily ask for that. It's really like look at what we've published, um, and then see if there's somewhere that you kind of fit into that spectrum, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. And I always like to talk about rejection when we have a unique perspective on the show, like we have with you, which, you know, you're on both sides of the rejection spectrum. You're giving rejection, you're receiving rejection. Is there anything like from being an editor and having to send rejections that makes it easier as a writer to take rejections or does it make it more difficult? Uh, yes and no, I think. Um, on one hand, like rejections or, or passing is what I really like to think about it, right? Because we're not necessarily rejecting that story because we're not the be all say all behind any story right if it doesn't fit for us it very well might fit for passages north or smoke long or pithead chapel any means or any kind of lit journal so we're just kind of passing at the moment and sometimes we get stories uh, that weren't quite ready and by the time we pass the author is or the writer has gone back and has has revised and then i'm really always happy to see those in other journals and go oh it found a great home that's wonderful um, so that part is not fun. Uh, I will tell you that Submittable makes it kind of easy to kind of batch them out. Um, so I'm not focusing individually on each pass um, letter the way you are as a writer, right? Like it's just you and it's just the one or it's just the five that you get in one day. And so that can definitely take its toll. I think there are times when I'm like, I think I've learned not to be so quick to submit. At first I was like, oh, I wrote it. It's great. I copy edited it real quick and I'm gonna get it out there. Um, and now just, I think part of it is just knowing it's part of a numbers game as well. Like we get, you know, well over 4,000 submissions a year 
and we're only going to take 40 at Fractured. That's what we have for our budget. So it's very similar to other literary journals. So I don't think you should cut yourself short as far as submitting. Like, I, you know, you should cast a wide net. And if we say no once or 20 times, I think you should still keep coming back to us. Um, your writing may change. Your one-off might be the thing that we were looking for. Um, it might come down to the point where like, you know, five years, five years down the road, like that's just the one story that we really want and we want to take it when we can only take 40 a year, uh, we are kind of hemmed in a bit. Um, so I, I try to tell and hope that writers never give up. Like I've submitted to smoke long 60 times and I haven't got in yet. I think eventually I will, hopefully one of these days it will. And there is a, you know, there is a certain sense of like, Ooh, that kind of hurt. Like I, I can't tell you that submit, uh, that rejections don't hurt a little bit. Um, but it's more just like finding the time to get it back out there, I think. Um, so that divide, yeah. I don't know if it helps or not. Um, I've slowed down, but I'm not writing quite as much either. So that might be that might be why too, because I used to submit like 200 times a year or something, and I'm probably down to like 50 times a year maybe. Does it, does it ever get easier to get rejected or to send rejections for that matter? Or passes? Um, yeah, or passes, sorry. <laughs> yeah. Um, <laughs> No, I don't know that it gets easier. Like I feel, I feel for each one that we send out um, because it is tough, but I also want them to be encouraged that like it didn't fit this time, but keep going. Um, I think you can get in your head about them for sure and think that it's more about the work than it is. Um, I feel like if you're getting in your head about the rejections, then find some beta readers that can read your stuff that you trust to tell you if it's working or not working. And if it is, and you trust that, then know that it that it is good and that eventually it will probably find a home. Um, I've learned a lot that there's a big difference between the art of writing and the business of publishing. Um, publishing, unfortunately, when you have to make choices about what you wanna put in or not put in in your budget is a business. Um, and it's all about getting more people to come to your site um, and read your stories to support your writers. Uh, writing is different. You know what I mean? Like you're doing it for you or you maybe you're doing it for readers down the road, but it's just you and the page and that's the art. And I have to try to keep that separate as much as possible to have fun on the page as much as possible before I even think about submitting. Um, so that's kind of how I separated it, I guess. Mm -hmm. So then, you know, you mentioned being on a, on a budget and getting all of these different, what separates like the really good ones, the ones that you choose to publish versus the ones that were really close. Like I feel like at a, at a certain point, it's like a flip of a coin. So what distinguishes them? Yeah. I think there is this really thin, like, you know, razor uh, between like what we take and what we don't take. Uh, and sometimes it's like, oh, we already had a story about mermaids, you know, so we're good. And that's not really a joke. Like we literally had, you know, like six mermaid stories and almost all of them were good. And we had to pick one of them when we did our um, ghost and fairy tales contest. Um, and part of it is uh, the immediacy of the stories in Flash. I love when stories are immediate. It's hard to write them in omniscient point of view. It's not that you can't, um, but it does make it a lot harder because the distance between reader, writer, and character is stretched pretty far. So um, stories that start off with really strong beginnings are usually the ones that we gravitate the most towards. And characters that are taking action and reacting. And usually for us, not always, there's some kind of reckoning for the character at the end. Um, those are usually the ones that we gravitate towards the most. And the ones that are almost sometimes have a flat ending. Uh, sometimes leave us a little confused about time and place in the beginning. Um, there's this idea I kind of have about Flash that has this kind of pattern to it with these um, images that kind of start in the beginning and then come back to us in the middle and then come back at the end. Those are the ones that usually have the best kind of unity. I won't talk about Poe's unity because I don't think it's quite accurate for Flash, but um, those ones that kind of have, you know, more than one story going on. Um, are usually the ones that we gravitate towards. The ones that we go, oh, we know exactly why we're reading this story. And also like, why this character, why this moment, why right now? We have a lot of stories that just kind of start or open. Um, and I think that's kind of the way the writer started in the draft, but they haven't gone back to figure out like, why this character, why this moment, why now? 
um, and and what are the stakes uh, or the decisions that the character is going to have to make in order to get to the to the end of this piece. Mm-hmm. So this seems like a good time to segue to talk about your writing. So you you I mean we've talked about it a bit already, but you started with Flash. That was sort of your first introduction into this, and you're you're just it seems like Flash is just it, it's where you are. It's what you want to do. So why Flash? What is it about it? Yeah, I think it's a good question. I wrote some awful longer short stories when I was an undergrad. I mean, some bad stuff. Uh, I think I like to get to the point where characters are forced to make decisions in the moment that we've given them on the, on the page. And I like to think about characters in just that one moment of their life. If they have this one moment that we're going to interact with them as a reader, what are we going to get? Right. And that's the flash, I think. Um, and in some ways I think I started uh, like a lot of people, probably um, I started with Carver, uh, especially those chopped up versions um, of those first ones published that were mostly flash, right? Like a lot of them were like 1200 words. So just slightly over flash. Um, but I really like the idea of putting two characters together, putting them on this very short roller coaster ride and seeing what happens to them. Um, I don't like a lot of exposition. I don't like a lot of explanation. I like to make inferences um, as a reader. Uh, I love reading novels too. So, I mean, every night when I go to bed, I'm not reading Flash every night because I do like to get lost, you know, in the bedrock of a novel and getting used to these characters and their desires over a long amount of pa- um, amount of pages. I just haven't figured out how to write that yet because uh, there's so much of the stuff that I just want to skip, I think. Um, I want every word, I think, to count, every character action to count, every image to count. Um, that's, I think, why I lean towards Flash. I mean, there are days when I think, oh, I'm going to... I, I need to write a novel. I need to write a novel. But then there are days when I think, well, maybe this is me. You know what I mean? Like Andre DeBuse never wrote a novel and his short stories are amazing. Um, I'm not saying I'm at that level by <laughs> any means, uh, but this just might be my wheel horse is when I sit down to write a flash for the most part, I feel comfortable, mm-hmm. I guess. Um, I've read, I don't know how many flash at this point. Um, you know what I mean? Like, it can't be a million yet, probably, but it, it's, you know what I mean? We're getting up there in the tens of thousands that I've read, probably. And I've just found that this is just where my voice works. Um, I like to kind of push the language. Um, I don't like sentences where, like, he just, he opened the door. It's not a bad sentence. And in a novel, it works great. But in Flash, I feel like the form itself demands more. And I want to take on that challenge. I also like that I can finish a flash in a sitting usually or within two sittings. And then I get to move on to new characters and new situations. So I think that's why I am fortunately or unfortunately stuck in the flash world. (laughs) So, I mean, it's perfect in that you're the editor of Fracture. I'm curious if being an editor, do you feel like that's, you know, because it's a big time commitment, but it's also, I'm sure, allowing you to improve your own writing, seeing all this other writing. So, Do you feel like being an editor has helped your writing more than it's hurt it? Yeah, no, I do. I do. I think uh, almost any writer will probably tell you that you need to read as much as possible, right? To see what other people are doing, um, to see what's become conventional or not conventional, to see what might be rules or might not be rules or just crazy or weird ways that that writers can do things. So I I think that that pushes me to be better. Um, and to find even more ways to kind of flesh out my my understanding of the form or my aesthetic view of the form. Um, there are times, I think, when I've, you know, you, re- you read a lot and then you're like, ooh, I'm just kind of stuck, right? Like the words are just kind of swimming in your head. I used to always wonder, like, all these fantastic writers, but that were also teachers, like, why it took 10 years to write a book. And now I understand, you know what I mean? Because they're giving a lot of their creative understanding or their analysis back to their students. And if you're constantly in this analysis editorial mode, it can be hard to get back to the fun, artful, playfulness on the page. Um, and it can be a little demoralizing too when you go back to the page and you, you're you still stuck in your analyzing stage. So you, I do have to kind of separate myself out of that. Um, mm-hmm sometimes to get back to the writing. But I, I do think it's made me 
a much better writer. I think even being a volunteer reader for those other literary journals made me much better writer just because I was seeing what all these other people were doing uh, and getting to read a lot more diverse voices than maybe I was before. Um, that's one thing too that we haven't quite talked about, but for um, for Fractured and Uncharted, we're trying to increase uh, the diversity that we have as far as writers that we're publishing as well um, from cultures or um, neurodiversity, um, any kind of underrepresented writer. And I, I think reading for literary journals or being an editor for a magazine, you're going to come across more writers in that vein that you might have missed um, mm -hmm. before. And I, so I do think it has made me a better, a better writer. Uh, and, you know, being a reader and a writer takes empathy, I think, anyway. Um, and so it helps me pour some of that empathy back into my characters on the page, I hope. Mm -hmm. And you beat me to one of my questions, uh, which was you, you brought up being a reader for these publications. There's so many opportunities to be a reader. Is that something you'd recommend? Like, is that something people should just go do? Does it help you be a writer or is it only for certain people? No, uh, I think if you have the time and the means to do it, I think you absolutely should if you can. Uh, I, I think that it's um, going to be hard for lots of people to necessarily do that. I mean, find a literary journal that maybe is not quite so rigid. Um, we have some of our readers that only read, you know, like an hour a week. We have some that take on, you know, three to five hours a week. Uh, we try to be really flexible with people's time, but also get as many diverse voices on our reader, reading staff as we can. So a lot of times being a reader is kind of a privileged position in the sense that like, you know, if, if you're doing everything that you can to, to get the bills paid, you may not have the energy to read for literary journals. And I completely um, understand that. But, but it is a way, like if you have any time to read at all, just to kind of give yourself Maybe do it for a month, you know, do it for six months, do it for two years. Um, you're going to see what other people are publishing. You're going to see how other readers are reacting to the work that's coming in through the queue. Um, and you're going to see why your editors are making the decisions that they're making. And I think in some ways that will help you kind of understand what's happening behind the scenes in lit journals. And hopefully maybe you won't take rejection or passing quite as personal and you'll know that like, I just have to keep trying because eventually I'll find the right editor or the right reader at the right magazine. So for me personally, it helped me find community. It helped me find the, the flash stuff that was going to be published before it was published. That's always fun. Um, and it helped me, yeah, see what all these other incredible writers were, were doing. And, and I had people to kind of talk about it with as well. Um, it probably, all, you know, without being a reader, I wouldn't have been an editor at the top of a magazine either. Um, they wouldn't have just plucked me out of nowhere, probably either. Um, it's definitely something to kind of work yourself into. That's one thing I try to help do at Uncharted Fractured as well, is help any of our readers that want to become editors kind of learn the process that we use. Um, I've also written uh, letters of recommendation for MFA programs or other editorships. So, um, like like other places, I think that, you know, it's kind of a family environment where you want to help the people that are helping you put out a good magazine. Mm -hmm. I want to get to some audience questions here. And, and if we have time, we'll get back to some of mine. But first question, uh, would you say it's common for journals with paid editorial staff to pull future editors from the reader queue? That's a great question. Um, yes, I think so. Uh, I think you've got known entities already in your pool. They're already putting in the volunteer work um, for your lit mag or your company, you've seen how they, um, address, uh, their critiques of certain stories through the queue. Um, you know, whether you can work well together or not work well together. So that's probably the first step. Again, I don't think that I would have this position if I had not, you know, started with that first magazine and then went to split lip and then went to craft and, and, and then now here. Um, so I think, yeah, if you, most places probably do, um, pull within, um, and that probably makes sense. A lot of businesses do the same kind of thing. Next question. Do you only want unpublished stories? Do you retain first rights? Oh, great question. Um, no, all rights go back to the writer. Um, I think ours is 30 days or 90 days. We can also break that if if needed. We don't hold on to the, the rights. Um, we just do, yeah, for serial rights, I think is what it is. Um, anyway, it goes back to you. Uh, we will also do reprints. Um, at either magazine, Fractured or Uncharted. Uh, in fact, 
I love doing reprints. Um, there are definitely stories that we have missed that other readers have missed throughout the years that are amazing um, that we can re showcase on our magazine, especially as we're growing. Um, Fractured has obviously a bigger readership than Uncharted does at this point, but we're getting there. Um, so yes, please feel free to, to submit uh, reprints uh, at either one of those. We do not pay for those, unfortunately. Um, but we did have a reprint that went into Best Small Fictions uh, last year, uh, Jan Stencombe. Uh, we picked up one of her pieces that a journal had kind of failed and left that piece kind of hanging and it was an amazing story. And so uh, it was able to get into Best Small Fictions. So you never know. Awesome. Uh, what are the current trends for Flash and how do you view the changes in Flash over the years? Wow, that's a fantastic question. <laughs> um, I think, and I am just one voice, <laughs> one person doing some reading. Um, there's lots of other people you should probably ask this too. Uh, but I think it's went from that 1986 sudden fiction version of a lot of traditional stories that had beginning, middle, ends that were just kind of short. Like they were a short story in miniature. Um, they weren't necessarily doing maybe what the own form of what Flash is or can do. Um, I think that people are experimenting with formats. We're getting a lot of, um, I don't want to say crab stories. What are they called? Uh, what are the crabs with the little shells? I can't think of them right now. Oh, anyway, hermit people, yeah, hermit crabs, hermit crab flash, um, <laughs> or hermit crab flash essays in nonfiction where they're taking other forms, um, like a menu and putting a story in through a menu or whatever. So we're getting a lot of those, a lot of list stories. Um, Flash has the ability to use white space in ways that other forms just can't do. Um, so anything that involves white space, I think is becoming more and more popular. Uh, I think people are playing around with the beginning, mini, beginning middle, end feelings. Um, I just looked at that story by Stuart Dybeck in my uh, sub stack and that, story goes all over the place in time and it's only like 300 words. Um, so I think people are playing with time. They're playing with voice. Um, they're playing with structure. Um, I'm seeing very, very exciting stories by diverse writers um, that maybe weren't being published before and they should have been um, seeing awesome, awesome things by women writers, non-binary writers um, that again, I think are finding ways uh, for bigger readerships than they would have maybe in like the eighties. I was born in 83. So I don't know if I can talk about what all was happening with, you know, dirty realism and all those kind of things. Um, but it's a great question. And I think if you just look at as many flash journals as you want, you'll see a lot of different things. Um, even the anthologies, the best small fictions and the best micro fiction, depending on who the judge is, I think makes a huge difference. The best micro from this year had Amber Sparks and there's a lot of, fairy tale type stuff, a lot of allegory, a lot of list. And those are the things that she writes and she writes fantastically. Uh, she's an amazing flash writer um, that leans towards the fairy tale kind of genre. So, uh, and different genres too, I think are, there's more horror, there's more sci-fi. It's not just traditional literary things anymore. Yeah, and speaking of form, I saw a story in the form of a calendar in Friction Magazine, which was awesome. It's, it's yeah. stuff I'd never seen before. <laughs> so cool. Uh, next question. When you say you have submitted 200 times a year, is that 200 different stories or say four stories to 50 different publications? Yeah, great question. Um, probably not four stories to 50 publications, but Flash tends to let you submit three stories at a time. Um, so I would have different batches of three stories or three micros or uh, one flash here and then two flash to go to those places because um, I'm mostly still working on flash and publishing flash. I don't think I've published a longer story in quite a while. Uh, my story that won the Lascaux Prize was actually like three flashes smashed together <laughs> to make a longer story. Um, so yeah, lots of different flash going out to different places. Um, a lot of journals, like even if they're quick, uh, it's hard to beat uh, Flash Frog and Pithead Chapel and Smoke Long, which are all five days or less, which is amazing. We can't even get that. And we have a whole readership. We're about a month, I think. Um, and so sometimes it's hard to wait in Flash where you're waiting three months, six months, nine months. Um, so I like to spread it, spread it out, I guess, when I submit. <laughs> And this next question is similar. Uh, as a writer, do you send out multiple submissions or one submission per journal? 
And then as follow up here, as an editor, what are your thoughts on both methods? Uh, yeah, great question. Um, at Fractured, we are open to you having something in one of our free categories and our contests at the same time. That's not a problem at all. Uh, hopefully it's a different story. Um, I hate when someone puts the same story in both categories because then I have to send you a double a double pass or a double decline letter, and that can't feel good for any <laughs> anyone. Um, and then Uncharted, we've allowed people to have a story in each one of the categories and the contest. Um, so as long as you're not overdoing it, we're usually somewhat open um, to multiple submissions. Like if you sent me, I think if you sent me three flash or like six flash all in one thing, like that, that's probably too much. Like take your time, just get some feedback from us and see, see if, how that's going. Um, and then for me, yeah, like I said, most places allow you to have three flashes. Um, and I think we do two at Uncharted just because I want to be as fair to our readers as possible um, since they were volunteering their hours. But yeah, I, I try to get the work. If it's ready to go, yeah, get it out there. Um, there. You have stories that you think, oh, this is the best and it's the one that's never picked up. And then you're like, oh, I don't know about this one, but I kind of love it. And then you send it out and like, it's the one that, you know, goes into best micro or what have you. So it's, I think it's really hard to tell like, what's a side what's b side kind of work and and just um you know find find the journals read them as best you can maybe one or two stories you can't spend your whole life reading them and then see what fits and and get your work out there next question how does one become a volunteer reader for your publication oh great question um i think for both of ours the insubmittable the form is up and it will walk you through how to volunteer or apply for that um we are a little full for Fractured right now. I think we have a couple spots really looking for some diverse readers for sure. Um, Uncharted, we definitely could use some more science fiction and uh, thriller readers for sure, um, but also all the other readerships as well. So just go to Submittable, those links are up and go from there. Um, if you're looking for other places to be volunteer readers, uh, people put calls out on Twitter, Facebook, uh, I'm trying to think where else you might find calls for readers. Sometimes on Submittable's Discover feature, um, sometimes in new pages, um, or just ask around with your, your writer friends and, and they may know of some spots to be volunteer readers. Almost all journals work, you know, with volunteer readers. So there's usually a spot you can find at some point. Um, and then hopefully it's a good fit. I like this next question. Does Uncharted accept funny horror ghost stories or any suggestions who does? Uh, good question. Uh, I wouldn't say no, uh, for sure. I think, um, as I was saying before about like my idea about like what a flash was, and then I, like everything changed once I started becoming an editor. I, we're very open to things that that work and and have resonance and and thrill us. Comedy, I think, is incredibly hard to write, but if you write it well, um, you're going to be bar none uh, above a lot of stories, just because they're those stories are hard hard to find, um, just because putting comedy on the page is a little different than the screen. Um, but we're very open. I, and, you know, if you're submitting to our free category, it's just free for your time. Uh, we never get mad about like having submissions to go through. Like that's our, that's our job and that's our joy. So send them. And then a uh, follow-up question. You'd mentioned how uh, Flash Frog and Smoke Long are super quick. What, what are some other quick magazines that have quick response times? Oh, that's a good question. Um, I th think I hit the top three. Uh, Milk Candy. Um, Published by Kathy Ulrich is incredibly fast. Uh, Middle House Review is very fast. Um, even Split Lip, I think, is within a month or so. I think anything, you know, less than a month is really fast, to be honest. Even 60 days uh, it trumps some of those, you know, nine-month, six-month, nine-month kind of things. Um, ooh, I'm trying to think of who else is who else is fast. They're gonna be mad if I don't if I don't <laughs> if I don't mention them, especially if I published with them before. Probably, uh, flash fiction, new flash fiction review is with less than a month. Uh, new world writing is less than a month. Uh, if you have a duotrope um, subscription, you can go on there, and that is one of their categories. Is fast journals? I think a new review is like one of the fastest. Um, Three penny is yes, thank you, Lauren is. So fast, we don't even know if they're actually <laughs> reading it or not. Actually, I think they are. I, I, I just think that they make decisions very, very, very quick. 
Uh, and then we have a question about the spelling of this. And I'll, I'll say this forever. We, we, I'll post the links in the show notes. So for Uncharted and, and Submittable and Fractured and all these things that we're mentioning, I'll include those links in the show notes. So if there are any more questions, get them in. But I, I want to get back to one question that it's come up a bit. So I want to get your take on it. And this is always such a tough question. But you mentioned knowing when a piece is ready. How do you know when a piece is ready to go out? Yeah, I think it's a good question. Um, for me, one way to do it is have beta readers, right? Ones that you trust that have read your work quite a bit, um, or even if you're just starting out, find people that you trust to read your work. Uh, you can also pay people to read your work as well. Um, and, and they can kind of help guide you as well because they the people that you're paying to read your work are probably seeing you know, tens of thousands of stories as well. So they'll have an idea of like, if it feels ready for publication or not. Um, a lot of it has just, does it have this feeling of completeness? Um, I talked about how images or metaphors kind of shift or change from the beginning to the middle to the end. Usually that's how I check my stories. Like have, have I not only told the story, but have I made sure that the images or the controlling metaphor is kind of shifted as well? And this thing is kind of a dubious thing to talk about. I really want to write a sub stack about it, but I haven't quite figured out how to put it into words. Um, but it's something that, yeah, I kind of learned um, taking a class, I think with Sarah Freely, um, she, you know, she said that metaphors work vertically, uh, whereas similes kind of work horizontally. Um, and, and so I think, you know, are, is everything just kind of churning in the right direction? Are the characters making choices? Do you have an opening that tells us an idea of the character, the situation, the setting um, that, that's piqued our interest? Are we, are we excited to read it? Is there some immediacy? Is there some velocity to it? And most of this I'm talking about for Flash. Uh, I think for, for genre stories over at Uncharted is a little different because our stories are longer, so we've got a little more breathing room there i think there it's have you given your characters enough opportunities to change or have a reckoning have they had to make enough choices or decisions or actions um for those longer stories um for flash yeah it's a hard question to answer and i think each writer has to to answer it for themselves in a lot of ways i think the more you write flash and the more you submit it and the more either you publish it or even get passed on and work with beta readers and take classes um, and, and break down flashes that you're reading, I think the more you'll get a handle of like, ooh, this, this feels like an ending now. Mm. So two more questions came in here. So this one, oh, it's a good question. Is there the option of submitting a story and asking for critique? Yes, um, both platforms have that option. Uh, there is a fee that comes with it, but the people that give the actual critique are getting... Uh, half of what the fee is. So half of the fee goes to back to the lit, mer the, the lit magazine, Fractured Uncharted, to turn back out to pay writers. And the other half goes to the person that is actually writing those critique letters. Again, we have amazing re readers on our staffs who are publishing uh, amazing stuff by themselves out in other literary journals. So you are um, getting some really great feedback from other writers. Uh, we don't really have time to give a lot of free um, feedback, unfortunately, uh, just because I said we get four to 6,000 submissions a year and we're already, like I said, fractured, I think is about a month and uncharted, I think is about two months. And I'd like to get that going faster. So we are hoping to be a little more speedy than, than hope than necessarily giving a whole bunch of, um, feedback for free. But when we can, we try, um, to do that. Otherwise, yes, there is a paid option. Um, for that, that when you submit, there's a box to click. Uh, sometimes I do those, um, that feedback. Sometimes I, I, I don't. It just depends on my schedule and our readers' schedules. And next question is, does Fracture accept sci-fi submissions? Yes, we do, with the caveat that we are very focused on characters, character action, character depth. So if it's just straight like world building in a flash for us, that's probably not the best place to send it. Uh, unfortunately, Uncharted is not accepting flash though. So uh, if you really like, uh, if you really like my editing uh, and you have a flash sci-fi, uh, we will definitely take a look at it. Um, we have published some things that lean a bit in that direction, but they definitely need to be guided by a character that's reckoning with something. 
So I just want to go now and ask you for uh, general advice to people that want to get into literary magazines or that want to follow sort of in what you're doing. What would be just a general bit of advice for them? Yeah, um, I think part of that is to dip in and start reading literary journals that you really love. You know, pick three, four, five, one, if that's all the time you have. You can find them very easily on Twitter or Instagram or Facebook because we're all trying to promote our writers and find the ones that you really like and, um, you know, submit to those. Maybe go read for those if you want to or read for other literary journals. Um, practice giving critiques with your beta readers form a community um, that will only increase your skills and you'll feel better about this writing world um, i have this really cool chat group uh, i know chat groups are kind of weird to talk about with the whole kidney thing from yesterday but i have a really great chat chat group um, that we are just a um a praise machine we just want to uplift each other in our successes and and when things are not so successful but for me I didn't have this kind of culture where I live. It's not here where I live right now. You can find um, your community. And I think that that's probably the first step if you want to be an editor or if you want to publish is to probably find a community. Um, and find it, yeah, find a good, and if it's not working for you, find another, find a new community. Mm -hmm. They're not all toxic. <laughs> <laughs> right. So then before we go, uh, where can people find you online? Social media? Yeah, wherever. great question. Um, so I'm definitely at Tommy Dean writer on Twitter. Um, I think I'm at Thomas R. Dean 13 on Instagram because it's through my Gmail. <laughs> um, I have a website um, that's currently being worked on. Um, so it'll be up soon. It's hopefully being revamped, but it is TommyDeanWriter.com. Um, I'm trying to think where else you can find me. Mostly Twitter. If you want to, if you haven't <laughs> engaged with me on Twitter, Twitter is probably the place, the easiest place to find me. My DMs uh, are open, especially if you're going to be nice and kind, or you just want to connect in a nice and kind, genuine way. Um, and then otherwise, yeah, I'm at FracturedLit.com, UnchartedMag.com, leading classes, other places, um, just doing too much all over the place, I guess. <laughs> All right. Thank you, Tommy. Thank you so much for being here today. This was great. Awesome. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks for the questions. Um, like I said, my whole goal is to help writers. So hopefully this was really helpful. Absolutely. Yeah. And to all of our listeners, uh, we'll be back next week. We're talking with Jasmine Darznick. Uh, so until then, thank you all for being here and we'll see you next time.